I'd like to just take a couple minutes to sort of uh, give you an orientation to the structure of hyper-research and uh, the terms that we use within the application, which are pretty simple. And we'll revisit these terms repeatedly and what they mean throughout the webinar. Um, but hyper-research has a, a model which is a little different than um, any of the other leading qualitative research packages that are out in the market. It's a model that we actually think gives you considerable more power and flexibility than some of the other packages that are out on the market. So we're, we, it's kind of something that we, we like. But um, for some people who think first and foremost of their source material, the material that they are um, reading through to learn the meaning of as being their sort of primary unit of analysis, um, our model does take a, a, a little uh, mental extension of that to sort of understand. So within hyper-research, you have <clears throat> a study file which contains all of the codes and information about those codes that you have um, coded from your underlying source material or the documents that you're working with in the course of your research, whether that's interviews or transcriptions of interviews, um, any other kinds of source material you may be working with. The study file contains uh, basically everything that's associated with a hyper-research study except the actual source documents themselves. So if I had a, a, a text file that was a transcript of an interview, um, we'll call it interview number one, uh, that document is is opened by hyper research and content is coded from it and recorded within hyper research um, but the source document itself remains a separate document uh, on your computer in whatever file or folder that you originally placed it on um, and is never actually loaded in to the hyper research study file so when you if you ever need to package up a hyper research study to send to a colleague or share with a colleague you need to not only send them the study file but if you want them to view the coded material within the context of the original source documents you need to send them your source files as well a hyper research study consists of at least one case and a case uh, is is nothing more than uh, sort of if you think of the old, old days, and, and some attendees on this webinar may not be old enough to relate to this, but the old, old days of sort of manual qualitative research, you would often have a pile of photocopied documents and a set of index cards, and you would annotate on the index cards that paragraph 3 of page 10 of this document had the following theme that I was seeing, the following uh, ideas that I was looking for in my qualitative research. Well, a case in hyper-research is nothing more than an electronic representation of that index card. It's a place where we annotate, as you go through and code your data, that in paragraph uh, 3 on page 5 of this document, I saw this code or this theme that I want to um, remember or, or note. Um, and so cases contain what we refer to as code references for your various source materials, your source documents, those interviews, transcripts, or other documents. Uh, in some models um, of qualitative analysis, uh, you really are just concerned about the individual documents, and you want to go through in a very grounded approach, immerse yourself in the data, and just code from the ground up the themes that you see as you read through the documents. In hyper-research, you don't have to have multiple cases. When we open up the application, as you'll see shortly, it comes up with a single untitled case, and you can literally code all of your source material to that one case, like having one big long index card. There are advantages to applying more structure in a research study, which we'll get to, but if that's the model that you're looking for, if you're just looking to understand what themes are prevalent over a series of source documents, say, you know, eight to ten interviews that you've done, uh, you can code them all to the single case and you never have to create new cases or manipulate new cases. Um, 
and you'll when you open hybrid research you'll see your your study you'll see that single case there with all the codes represented you can however create structure say you had that 8 to 10 subjects that you were looking at you could classically associate each case with a subject where you may have more than a single source document. You may, for example, have a transcript of the interview with that subject that you code to, and you may have another document which is your own memos or notes or observations about the, the interview that you are also coding, and you could have a third document or fourth or additional documents that all relate to that one subject. Uh, Cases can also have codes attached to them that come from multiple different types of material. You can code source documents that are text files. You can code source documents that are pictures, images, photos, maps, whatever. You can code audio recordings, MP3 files, WAV files, things like that. You can code um, video as well um, inherently within the application. So for some people, even though you may have a transcript of an interview, you may want to have the actual recording of the interview as well to code nonverbal nuances, such as tones of voice. You know, the person spoke in an alarmed tone or a very heated tone or passionate tone about a topic. Um, that's stuff that's not always captured in a, a straight transcript, especially if you are, say, not doing the transcripts yourself, but sending them out to a transcription service to have your audio uh, recordings of interviews transcribed into text. So sometimes it's very helpful to have the original media that you may have captured the interview from there to record nonverbal nuances. Um, uh, but you also don't have to use cases to represent individuals. For example, a case may represent a group. You might be doing a study of both uh, in an educational system of uh, some perspective and you're interviewing both teachers, students, and parents in that educational system. You could have a case be uh, the group that represents all the students, and each of the interviews with the students uh, all coded that case, a second case representing the teachers, and a third case representing the parents. Um, it's simply, a case is simply an organizational unit to allow you to group your source material and the codes from that source material together that is beneficial when you want to compare one group to another. So if you want to compare responses from all the students in this example to the teachers to or teachers to the parents or parents to the students or combinations thereof, um, organizing them into separate cases becomes very useful within hyper-research. Um, a particular case has a very simple representation, analogous to the index card. You'll see as we go into the application, it, there's basically four columns, one for the code names, one that tells you what the name of the document or source that that code was, was coded to, the type of the code, the type of the source material, is it text, is it video, is it audio, and, um, and then a reference. And our references in uh, Hyper Research are really simply pointers into the material. A text reference of something like, um, you know, code uh, 1 to, to 235 literally means that this code was coded to the chunk of text, the passage of text, the paragraph, that goes from character 1 to character 235 within that source document. Um, and you'll see that image references and video references are similar. A video audio reference is simply from so many minutes and seconds into the video or audio to so many minutes and seconds represents a chunk of video or audio that you have coded with this code. So hopefully that gives you a, a basic orientation to the structure of the application. With that said, we're now going to, um, to head into Hyper Research. Oh, one other concept that will come up, that is the codebook. Um, which is becoming a common term in qualitative uh, data analysis packages. Um, and the code book is simply your sort of list of master codes used throughout your study. Um, and it gives you a, a common place to see all the different codes uh, or themes that you have in your study. So now let's go into Hyper Research and begin taking a look at the application.
So uh, just a few things. The current version of Hyper Research is version 3.02. Um, uh, if you have an earlier version of Hyper Research or if you're uncertain as to what version of Hyper Research you are at, uh, you can go to the Help menu and choose About Hyper Research and it will show you the version number. Um, uh, and from that, you can tell whether you're at the current version or the previous version. If you're at version 3.0 or 3.01, it is a free upgrade to 3.02, and we strongly encourage you to upgrade to 3.02 as it corrects several bugs that were discovered in 3.0 and 3.01. Um, if you're at an earlier version, uh, the, the previous version before 3.0 was 2.83. Um, uh, I think you'll find that 3.0 offers a lot of compelling features um, that you may interest you in upgrading to. With that said, um, I'm just going to repeat this process so I can show you that startup window one more time. And I, I apologize. Uh, slip on the trackpad, I clicked on the wrong version of Hyper Research. There we go. So when Hyper Research comes up, we have this sort of welcome screen. Any recent studies that you've been working on will be shown here. You can always create a new study, new entitled study, to start a new research project. Um, you have immediate access to sort of the help and tutorials information if you, if you want to access that. Um, for purposes of sort of starting the basics, I'm going to start with a blank study um, and just show you some of the basics associated with it. And then we'll use uh, a couple of our sample studies for some examples a little bit further on in this demonstration. So I select a new untitled study. Um, as I said, you, you end up getting what we refer to as the study window. Um, it is showing you your cases. In this case, you only have one case, which is uh, uh, called untitled. It's the initial default case. You have those columns I mentioned where it, as you code materials, you'll see the codes here. You'll see the name of whatever document they were coded from here. You'll see a type indicator here and some, some numbers that represent a pointer into that content that will be recorded here. And there is virtually no limit as to the number of codes you can put on a case. It's on the order of 4 billion codes, and we haven't run into anyone yet who has come close to that, but someday, maybe. Um, uh, to, to rename the case... Um, you can go to the case menu uh, and select rename. So very intuitive. Uh, if this is my first interview, I might call this interview 01. Or if I was using name subjects, I might call this John or Fred or Charlie or Harry or, or whatever, Susan, whatever I'm using as my naming convention. In a sort of classic model where I have uh, an interview with a series of subjects, um, you know, this might be an ID number for a study or, again, anything that you want to put in here. So I might rename my case because the first thing I'm going to start doing is opening my source material, start reading through it, and looking for themes, a very grounded approach, right? I can then go to the source menu. I can choose to open a source file. 